Nomai, Hairamai, welcome. I'm Bruce Munro, and with me is International Relations Specialist, Professor Robert Patman, and this is Global Insight. Donald Trump is set to become the 47th President of the United States, only the second US President to win a non-consecutive second term. What does it mean for the United States and the world for the next four years? Welcome, Robert. Morning, Bruce. How different do you think is the future of the world under a Donald Trump presidency compared with what it would have been under Kamala Harris? Uh, I think if we're to go by the rhetoric and the vision of both candidates, very different. Uh, but we've got to qualify that a little bit. Um, Mr. Trump has a view of the world in which great powers run the world. And since the United States is the most powerful of all, that means America sees its vision as relatively unencumbered. It's got little time for multilateral institutions like the UN, the WTO, World Trade Organization, the International Criminal Court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so from Mr. Trump's point of view, in an international relations context, it's back to basics. American primacy will be uh, underscored. Um, Harris's vision was much more traditional. Um, uh, big emphasis on America's alliances and paying lip service, if not in theory, but or not always in practice, for support for international institutions. Um, the reason I qualified these differences is because sometimes events occur which define a presidency. We saw it with George W. Bush. 9-11 came out of a clear blue sky. If we, have, if we had a sort of discussion like this after George W. Bush had won the election, 9-11 would not have figured it. And I'm sure Mr. Trump is going to be confronted with foreign policy challenges, which could um, shape him considerably. Uh, so it's the unanticipated um, points that could shape the, the, the Trump presidency. And we also have to take into account what Harris and Trump have in common, uh, a belief in US exceptionalism, that the US is the model uh, liberal democratic society. Virtually every polit politician in the US finishes their their stump speeches by saying America is the greatest democracy in the world. Anyone who heard Mr. Trump's victory speech last night would, would not have been disappointed on that score. Um, similar, you know, Kamala Harris has said similar things. Uh, another factor which unites Americans, uh, American political contenders for the White House, is the belief in US primacy. So both Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump, although they disagree profoundly on a whole range of things, and Kamala Harris and Mr. Trump also profoundly disagree, um, they would agree that America should remain number one in the world. So th 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 there, there is some, what I call, there's some changes, but there's also points of continuity that we should not be, we should not ignore. Right. And you talk about this primacy, this sense of America is number one. Yeah. But what is the state of the United States and what does this election show us about the state of the United States? Well, that's a very good question because uh, recently a student said to me, America's declining quite rapidly in the 21st century, but it doesn't acknowledge it or even realise it. And I pondered that a little bit because that's an interesting point. Um, we've seen in the 21st century that China has emerged as a second superpower. And um, many of the problems that the United States face can't be fixed by the US. Primacy assumes you can fix problems. In fact, Mr. Trump went through his litany in his final speech in Michigan of all the things we're going to fix. But that list didn't include climate change, didn't include pa global pandemics, didn't include transnational terrorism, and it didn't include problems of the extended world economy which do not respect borders. So in, a sh in short, um, Mr. Trump's going to face challenges between his rhetoric and the realities of the world we live in. And one of the realities that all presidents are going to have to deal with in the 21st century and has contributed to a sense of American powerlessness is the proliferating number of problems which don't respect borders. So, and also the realities of China's power and, the, and also the rise of India. So, you know, uh, primacy is all very well and good. It, it sells well domestically. Um, but that he's going to bump it against the reality is that the rest of the world uh, do, are not particularly comfortable with the idea that they're going to take their lead from the United States. Right. And so picking up on that then, the rest of the world has been watching this US yep. elections. 
what now is happening behind the scenes at a government level, at, in diplomatic circles, to prepare for a change of, of presidency such as this one? Well, I think there'll be almost ritual congratulations from around the world, even from people who have no time for Mr. Trump, because they'll all be hoping out of self-interest of self -interest, to at least start off on a reasonably positive note. Um, so one or two countries which are probably not too happy with the outcome have certainly been amongst those who've extended uh, their congratulations. And um, President Zelensky was one of them, for example. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, I think, you know, I think governments clearly have prepared for this possibility. But your question is a good one because it, it's not just what I call protocol or diplomatic conventions in responding to a mercurial and sometimes unpredictable leader like Mr. Trump. Uh, but there's also questions of whether, you know, you, uh, one question that's actually doing the rounds in Europe at the moment is Europe really must depend on itself for, uh, for its defence. It's got to take, it's got to step up. It's got the capability, but it's never had the political will. And can they go on? I think one of the lessons of the first administration of Trump when he criticised NATO, are those European members of NATO going to continue uh, to allow Mr. Trump to dictate their approach towards Ukraine. I'm not saying he's trying to dictate their approach towards Ukraine. I'm just saying at the moment, many European countries look to the Biden administration to set the lead. And I'm just wondering, one of the unintended, uh, one of the unanticipated consequences of Mr. Trump's re-election, let's face it, it was an incredible, and we've got to be fair here, it was an incredible political comeback, Bruce. One of the greatest performances in American uh, domestic politics um, and few people gave him much chance I mean this was a person who we thought may be in jail by the time of the, 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 tw the 24 election would become along he's a convicted felon and he had indirect participation in the insurrection so putting that to one side politically this is a tremendous achievement to come back from such a desperate situation um, can I yeah. can I jump in sure. there and pick you up on what you were saying about Europe? Because I had wondered about this. Yeah. The whole issue of Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like Trump is going to go for uh, some sort of outcome. He said he's going he's to sort the war straight away. Yeah. I don't, I'm imagining that it can't be the sort of result that, that most of Europe is going to be happy with. This could create quite a break between Europe and the US. It potentially could, but we shouldn't underestimate the degree of deference towards the United States, which seems to be an ingrained habit. Uh, British Prime Ministers, um, you only have to think of Mr Blair and it looks like Mr Starmer, and certainly Mr Johnson. Um, British Prime Ministers have shown terrific de deference to an American President. And so that's a habit that they will have to kick if they, uh, but you see the Ukraine at the invasion of Ukraine by Russia threatens them directly in a way that uh, they've got to come to terms with. And I don't think, for example, many people in Germany, I'm not necessarily talking about the government in Germany, uh, Olaf Scholl, but the opposition will not be happy with any arrangement that leaves Mr. Putin with 20% of Ukraine, which he has illegally annexed uh, from uh, Ukraine. Uh, so. I think there is a real potential for a split between Western Europe and the United States on European security. Mm, right. And so then thinking down in our neighbourhood, what does a selection result mean for New Zealand and does it mean the same thing for us as it does for Australia? On the face of it, again, we have to say this with a pinch of salt because Mr Trump has pledged to impose all tariffs on all imports. And uh, that's bad news for New Zealand because <laughs> it's our second biggest market. It recently displaced, I think it was last year, the US displaced Australia as our second biggest export destination. So um, if, the, if Mr. Trump follows through on his rhetoric, um, and I think he probably will feel quite honor bound to do so, having made that big pledge that he was going to put tariffs on foreign products to help the American workers, um, that will mean an extra 10 to 20 percent uh, tariff on New Zealand products being sold. And that will have quite negative consequences, not just for New Zealand, 
Uh, but it will have, because other countries will be involved, but uh, it will definitely have a doubt, it would deflate or undermine global trade. So can Trump simply do that? Does it break any sort of FTAs? Can you go to the WTO over this sort of thing or, or what? No, because Mr. Mr. Trump undermined the WTO by not appointing appellate judges to the disputes resolution uh, panel in the WTO. Uh, he deliberately did not support the reappointment of new people. So when those ex serving their terms ran out, they were not renewed. Mr. Biden didn't change Mr. P uh, Trump's policy of undermining the WTO. And uh, so uh, Mr. Mr. Trump will have a lot more freedom to do these things than if we had uh, a functional WTO, because he would then be in contravention of it. So, yeah, I mean, this is going to cause a lot of irritation, uh, I think, for other parties in the international order. Um, you mentioned Australia. One thing where there could be a convergence between New Zealand and Australia, um, Australia have already indicated they weren't wildly enthusiastic about being part of AUKUS and largely paying for it under Mr Trump's leadership. And so it would be interesting to see whether buyer's remorse really sets in in Australia. Um, because Mr Trump and Mr Vance have made it quite clear any multilateral alliance with America is involved has to serve, these are Mr Trump and Mr Vance's words, has to serve above all American interests. So uh, there's no give and take in this multilateralism. It's America first and the others have to follow. So the idea of consultation is America tells its allies what they should be doing and, that, and, and they listen. So summing it up, what, do we, what are we looking forward to over the next four years? Very difficult to say because my crystal ball is no better than anyone else's. Uh, I think we're possibly in for quite a turbulent time and we could see some traditional alliances like between Western Europe and the United States coming under strain. Um, on the other hand, Mr. Trump may find himself confronted quickly with a crisis which he has to react to. And I think he's more pragmatic. The thing about Mr. Trump, the reason I hesitate to answer your question, he's very unpredictable and you know, mercurial. He could fall out for, with Mr. Netanyahu, for example. On the face of it, Mr. Trump being elected and the Netanyahu government's delighted by that. But Mr. Trump sometimes takes exception if he thinks he's been slighted or outperformed, overshadowed. And so things can happen. Um, it, it's very difficult. Uh, on the face of it, we're going for a period in the next four years where free trade will be undermined international institutions will become weaker. And for the smaller and middle powers, uh, they're going to have to exert more agency. That is, they can't just depend on others, whether institutions or great powers, to help them. So it, we're going through a very interesting international transition. Um, and as I said in my early remarks, uh, he may like it or dislike it, but Mr. Trump cannot walk away from climate change. He, could, he will pull America out again from the Paris Accord, but the problem will not go away. So it's going to be an interesting period um, whereby Mr. Trump has to adjust to the realities of being in power. Thank you, Robert. And thank you for watching. Catch us next time on Global Insight. Noho Oremai.